The Dauntless Astronomy by Ebenezer Breach Ladies and gentlemen, truth is great and must prevail, so that all who are taught, led, or persuaded to contend for the impossible must sooner or later knuckle down to the possible, the inevitable, and the true. Man's nature, since the fall, is so constituted that imposture has more hold on his intellectual faculties than truth, and that which is false can attain much more ready and universal acceptance than that which is true. Thus, a lie, once made to fit, can get round the world while truth is putting its boots on. It has been thus with modern astronomy which is considered by all the educated and learned to be such a certain, settled, and intellectual science that they are disgusted with the least hint that this boasted science is founded on a scanty and baseless foundation. But the truth will out, and if any man wishes to be wise, even in the things of this world, he must be willing to commence fool that he may be wise. Prince Bismarck said, I have always endeavored to learn new things, and when I have had, as a consequence, to correct an earlier opinion, I have done it at once, and I am very proud to have done so. A Portsmouth tradesman said when spoken to on the subject of astronomy, I am quite satisfied about it, and if I am wrong, I have no desire to be put right. An American writer says, The man who does not care to learn if his decision is right or wrong is not half a man. This is a lamentable state of mind on any matter, but on the subject of astronomy it is very inconsiderate. Suppose Dr. Cousins, for instance, were to tell you that your heart was the breathing apparatus of your system, and the lungs, the organ that propelled the blood through your veins, you would think he was a long way from being an eminent Portsmouth physician. And quite rightly, too, for no medical man could understand the human frame if his knowledge of physiology held such a baseless theory. It is precisely the same with the science of astronomy. No astronomer can be correct with the science unless he understands fully the relative and active positions of the sun and earth, the sun being the anima mundi, the soul and heart of the universe. It matters not how many lines, angles, pretty wheels, and cat sticks they may draw, nor how wonderfully they may seem to magnify, calculate, and exaggerate the distances and magnitudes of the heavenly bodies. If they reckon on a revolving earth, and simply a standing sun, all is wrong. They make their boasted knowledge the mere tool of astonishingness, not the natural or sublime science of astronomy. Much will be the surprise to most readers to learn that all modern measurements of the heavenly bodies are based upon the results of experiments that really mean the peculiar position and toss-up of a halfpenny. Mr. Richard Proctor, the great modern astronomer, tells us, Anyone can tell how many times its own diameter the sun is removed from us. Take a circular disk an inch in diameter, a halfpenny for instance, and see how far it must be placed to exactly hide the sun. The distance will be found to be rather more than 107 inches, so that the sun, like the halfpenny which hides his face, must be rather more than 107 its own diameter from us. So that the supposed distance of 95 million miles rests upon the peculiar position of one halfpenny. Whatever the halfpenny should happen to reveal, that decides and regulates the magnitudes, distances, and calculations of all the rest of the heavenly bodies, ad infinitum, to the world's end. For he says, We are so constituted as to seek after knowledge, and knowledge about the celestial orbs is interesting to us, quite apart from the use of such knowledge in navigation and surveying. It is easy to show that the determination of the sun's distance is a matter full of interest for on our estimate of the sun's distance depend our ideas as to the scale, not only of the solar system, but the whole visible universe. The size of the sun, its shape, and therefore its might, the scale of those wonderful operations which we know to be taking place upon, within, and around the sun, all these revelations, as well as our estimate of the earth's relation and importance in the solar system, 
depend absolutely and directly on the estimate we form of the sun's distance. Such being the case, this being in point of fact the cardinal problem of dimensional astronomy, it cannot but be thought that, great as were the trouble and expense, sometimes reaching a quarter of a million of money, of the expeditions sent out to observe the transit of Venus of 1874, they were devoted to an altogether worthy cause, to establish and vindicate the gigantic fabrications given out for an educated and trained youth as well as the public to swallow as the pure and undeniable results of a toss-up of a single halfpenny. Some have ridiculed the bun. What about the halfpenny? Well, sure enough, astronomical falsities are like the proverbial lawyer's lies. They are official, therefore current. As long as they are official, canonized, stamped by government, and printed by authority, they may be used by the bushel. But you must not indulge in them personally, or singly. If children do, their parents will be angry. Their schoolmaster will cane them. Their governess will stand them on the form. Their minister will denounce them. If adults, from the pulpit as black sheep, for others to be aware of. And some ministers will thunder against Jacob's deception, yet coolly allow their school children to be taught the greatest deception and lies of the age in geography. Science ought to be a collection of truths, but the astronomers and geologists have made it a collection of lies. We cannot verify as truth that which is not of itself indisputably true, nor are the scriptures a ladder we can kick away with regard to the science of nature any more than the science of the soul. Everyone is considered nowadays behind the times, and the age who does not believe in the results of the halfpenny. But there are some phenomena in nature which suggest false ideas. There are manifold ways in which our senses may deceive us unless their evidence is carefully cross-examined. It strikes us that this halfpenny requires a great deal of cross-examination. We tried it ourselves and could hide the sun at 37 inches. That would make a lot of difference all around, from Greenwich to Venus, and from the transit of Venus to the sun, which never budges an inch for the greatest astronomer, or the most costly coin of the realm. Not even Sir William Pink's Christmas calculations would make the slightest of difference to Phoebus, who simply avenges all mistakes by still traveling and shining. It would be difficult to say which was the most ridiculous problem, the Hindu notion of the earth resting on the back of an elephant, or the British notion of the distance of the sun resting on the top side of a halfpenny. But doubtless, the Hindus is the most beautiful and natural. But Sir William Pink places undoubted reliance on results from the top of a halfpenny, as witness the first paragraph in his Christmas Address of 1893, which commences, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, some astronomers a few weeks since held a meeting with a profound lover of the heavenly bodies in the chair, for the purpose of demonstrating that the earth is not round and does not revolve, but is somewhat the shape of a wedding cake with figures on the top and sugar representing the everlasting snows, glaciers, and frozen arctic regions. These learned men had the temerity to attest that the sun revolves round the earth, so that the sun must travel 270 millions of miles in 24 hours, or over 11 millions of miles each hour. Well, if this assertion was true, we are afraid we would not get any seasons, and Christmas addresses would not be required, or perhaps all the inhabitants may want to burrow in the huge plum cake. However, as the season has arrived, notwithstanding all these opinions, we again resume the pleasing duty of addressing you. The sun is a concentrated body of light, heat, and attraction, not an expanded substance at all. Its actual distance less than 6,000 miles. The worthy alderman makes a mistake when he says, that we held a meeting for the purpose of demonstrating that the earth is not round. We thoroughly believe it is round, like a table, or like a circular wedding cake, but not globular, like an orange, nor a spheroid. Then astronomers could not afford such a luxury as sugar to represent the everlasting snows. Pure white wadding did that, the iceberg represented by grocer's soda, 
which Bet Mullins was unaware was to be found at the North Pole. Then Sir William says, We had the temerity to assert that the sun revolves round the earth. We only had the temerity to assert that which the glorious sun has had the temerity to perform for the last six thousand years. And even Mr. Richard Proctor, the late great astronomer, details very graphically the railway of the sun. If the sun has its daily, monthly, and yearly pathway round the heavens, the earth can have no pathway round the sun. That phenomena would be entirely obnoxious to the economy of nature, where nothing is arranged but on the basis of philosophical necessity. Consequently, he who made both heaven and earth always proclaims the sun the traveller, never the earth, so we render unto all their dues. We can assure the knight of Shire that it is only necessary for the sun to travel in a spiral path fifteen miles per minute, fifteen degrees every hour, from east to west, altering its position northward or southward about one degree a day, and will be done by its constant journeys through the twelve signs of the zodiac, the belt of the sky, which if he refers to Keith on the globes, page four, he will find mapped out for each month in the year, which movement alone, and constantly, regulates the seasons, which produces in regular order the Christmas fruits he secures for his customers, and which he acknowledges in his next paragraph was produced by the extraordinary warmth of the sun. Perhaps the address was commenced in the middle of the day, when it was time for the afternoon nap, and we imagine therefore the pen dropping on the desk, and a respite is had in dreamland, and lo, one of the alderman's fields may produce next year a million pumpkins that will produce a million threepenny bits from his millions of customers, who surround him millions of times during the year, from all parts of the known world. And lo, in the middle of the field, one bumper pumpkin grows to the representation of the sun that may go to the drill shed in November, and win a first-class prize. Won't that be good luck? He is astonished at the dream. It does not matter what those fellows said at the Albert Hall. I've seen it all in a dream. Talk about the sun not being larger than the earth. Why, it had to travel 270 millions of miles in 24 hours. It must burst asunder soon. And if my sunny pumpkin burst, all the juice would run out. Then my prize would be lost at the show. Oh, 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 I will never have that. But there... We will believe the wholesale grocer understands the evolutions and revolutions of tea, cheese, and bacon much better than the sun, moon, and stars, so grant a free pardon for all astronomical blunders. If the earth, therefore, remains in the same situation while the sun revolves round it, its mass must be much greater than that of the sun, for it is contrary to the laws of nature for a heavy body to revolve round a light one as its center of motion. The fact is, there is no doubt that our Creator has worked upon the number ten in the creation. Ten divides the allotted period of the world's present era, six thousand. Ten divides the millennium, one thousand years, to be spent by the redeemed of all nations in heaven, not on earth, as is usually reported. Ten divides the jubilee and the captivity, the life of man, the plagues of Egypt, the kings, and the horns of Antichrist, also the ten days of persecution. Now the earth is at least ten thousand miles in diameter, not eight thousand. Enough has been allowed for the South Pole, the circumference of which no ship approaches within two thousand miles, while the center of the earth is the North Pole, immediately under the North Star, the center of the heavens, which never varies its position. The president of the Geographical Society stated at the Portland Hall on one occasion that tropical vegetation had been found as far north as Disco. If found any farther north, they would have to change the present accepted theory of the shape of the earth. The sun is not more than one-tenth the diameter of the earth, nor more than six thousand miles distant. Everything else in proportion, and everything, is within ten thousand miles of us so that the redeemed often are permitted to hear the songs of heaven before they reach there. What beautiful singing of birds I hear, said a doctor as he was dying in St. George's Square. Open the windows and doors, and let me hear that beautiful music, 
said another dying saint in Sultan Road, Landport. Eclipses are never occasioned by the Earth's intervention, or they would not be recorded three times out of four, invisible at Greenwich. They are entirely associated with, ruled by, and dependent on the heavenly bodies. When a planet crosses the sun, it is a black disk. Eclipses are easily and correctly predicted by the Metonic system, not at Greenwich, but those able to compile the nautical almanac for Greenwich. The Chaldeans had the celebrated Metonic system of 19 years and could calculate eclipses for hundreds of years in advance. An eclipse has been known to occur while both luminaries have been above the horizon, so the Earth was entirely left out. The moon has also a spiral motion twelve times faster than the sun through the zodiac stars. All agree it is the nearest of heavenly bodies. Then how ridiculous to state that the nearest star is one hundred times more distant than the sun. With regard to the ocean, it is most certainly a level. Several gentlemen that have been to sea all their lives attest the same. As level as the road, said one to me, also experienced by the authorities that have had years of experience at the dockyard semaphore. A globular ocean is absurd in theory, ridiculous in imagination, and never had an existence. The same phenomena that occurs with a ship outward or homeward bound would never occur on the plains of the Orinoco, which are level for a thousand miles. Would anyone declare the level plain to be globular because the pole of a van might be seen first? owing entirely to laws of perspective and angular vision? This has been tested in our own experience with an opera glass. If the earth revolved a hundred and twenty times swifter than a cannonball, no engine would keep the metals, as nothing will remain on the drum of the shaft, unless it is spliced on. The life of no living creature would be worth five minutes' purchase after it had started one revolution. The laws of gravitation is a myth, a vain imagination, and a scientific toadstool. A light is never made larger than the place to be enlightened. A room is never taken round the light, but the light round the room. A light is never placed far distant, but as near as possible. All matter is inert and motionless, so we are not a set of leapfrogs leaping about on Newton's merry-go-round, but stately men and women walking on a stable and fixed earth. Thus we cannot do without railways, by reckoning so many jumps to each place as we want it, and it comes round, or we might be able to reckon three jumps to London, four jumps to Kent, eight jumps to Birmingham, and back again in tent. With regards to navigation, an artificial globe is never taken to sea to sail by, but always superficial charts as flat as the surface of the sea. One of the greatest lighthouses just opened is fully visible at the distance of 300 miles. Navigators always take the sun, never the earth, and they use tables compiled 200 years ago and handed to them by pagans 200 years before that. How much more simple would navigation be if the dictates of nature were accurately and fully followed? Captain Perry and several of his officers on ascending high land in the vicinity of the North Pole repeatedly saw for twenty-four hours together the sun describing a circle upon the southern horizon, a spiral motion. And the moon, which has charge of the tides, Captain Perry says, had the appearance of following the sun round the horizon. Nature can be watched and tested, and no baseless theories can long survive attack. Truth is great, and must prevail. It cannot be too emphatically impressed on the reader's attention that the earth has nothing whatever to do with regulating or causing the seasons, no more than a guard's van has to do with supplying the locomotive power for a railway train. The mandate at creation was, let them, the heavenly bodies, be for seasons, not let it, the earth, be for seasons. When Job was asked by his creator if he could bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion, what was meant was, Canst thou prevent the return of either spring or winter? For the turn of Pleiades referred to certain stars or constellations denoting spring, and Orion to certain others denoting winter, as was well understood by the people in the east. Maseroth is the Chaldean name for zodiac, 
So the Creator acknowledged the direct cause of the seasons, and all his works praise him, and are sought out by all them that have pleasure therein. See the rising hills neath yonder azure sky, and under spreading woods the sloping valleys lie. Yours faithfully, Ebenezer Breach.